Good afternoon and happy Sunday. I'm Sylvia Carmen Cubina, Executive Director of the BASS, and I would like to give you a warm welcome to Curator Culture. This is the seventh in a series sponsored generously by the Knight Foundation. So for the past two years, we have been doing a mashup of talks where we invite artists, writers, musicians, celebrities, elected officials, elected officials, designers, and even a nightclub impresario. Um, we've known the importance throughout these two years of reaching diverse and large audiences, which is why every single one of these seven um, talks has been live streamed on Facebook in real time. What we didn't know was that today our museum would be closed and it's only viewed via technology. So um, today, despite the museum being closed to the public, I would like to introduce moderator, poet, activist, Tom Healy, as the Bass continues this series, but this time with a new, more urgent cult, uh, title to the series. Curator culture, we interrupt our regularly scheduled Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. And uh, welcome to everybody. It's a strange thing to do this with uh, an audience that's I know people are signing in from around the globe. So welcome, welcome to Miami. The sun has actually just come out here and so it's hitting my, my face from, from outside. Um, today we have two extraordinary people who uh, I've been following for a long time. One is my good friend, Donna Shalala, who's the Congresswoman from the 27th District of Florida and is my member uh, of Congress and Donna comes from, uh, has an extraordinary history that began as a Peace Corps volunteer in Iran, uh, one of the first members of the Peace Corps, I think, right, Donna? And uh, leading several universities, including most recently the University of Miami. And of course she was the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services under President Clinton and the longest serving uh, uh, secretary that we've had in that department. So welcome, Donna. Thank you very much, Tom. Great to see you. Good to see you too. And we have from the West Coast, from California, the extraordinary artist Liza Liu. And Liza, I felt like I've known you for a long time because you have that feeling when you've known artists work for, for a long time. And I've, I've seen you talk and known your work. I first saw The Kitchen, the uh, beginning piece of yours that so many people know about when it was at the New Museum in 1996. So I feel like I've known you uh, for a very, very long time. We go way but, back. <laughs> yes, we go way back. So welcome and thank you both. Thanks so much for, for being here with us. That's lovely to be here. Thank you for yeah. doing this. This is such a wonderful, I keep thinking of the phrase by all means possible. We're just, you know, all of us doing what we can to connect. So, yeah, thanks. So the, the idea for this series that we're going to do a, a number of conversations between people who are in uh, elected office of politics and policy making and artists, uh, visual artists, performing artists, to talk about this sense of everything possible and what does it mean to be in this moment, uh, a moment that is has a lot of pain, a lot of fear, a lot of loss, but also a lot of good work that, that people are doing and, and a lot of questions that people are working hard to, to answer. And, what does it mean to be in a, in a moment like that? And I partly got the inspiration because both of you are people who've seized this moment in a way and to directly address it in what you're doing. And Liza, maybe you could talk about that a little of what, what you've been doing, particularly over the last two months uh, and how that's both been online and, and in your own practice. And uh, maybe you could tell that to some people don't know yet. Well, I think that um, the things that the thing that initially, you know, when this whole thing kind of unfolded, Donna, you probably were watching it um, earlier than most of us. Um, but for for sort of the general public, it sort of hit it felt like it hit like a bomb. You know, it felt like it just kind of came out of nowhere um, in March, really. I mean, we started to hear rumblings of it, but it, it wasn't anything anyone was sort of taking seriously. So by the time it really happened, there was this sense of um, 
of total devastation where suddenly, you know, you're counting up how many lentils you have in the cupboard and wondering, you know, well, how are we going to get groceries? And I think that that kind of being leveled like that for all of us on a collective sort of um, was such a kind of shock. And the the first thing that I saw that was that was sort of amazing was the Italians, you know, uh, singing the who were um, you know from the the rooftops and banging on drums and and taking pots and pans and sort of um, that, that kind of celebration that was happening, and kind of realizing, well, okay, yes, this is this really terrible moment, but at the same time, seeing people's kind of humanity rise up, seeing the kind of insistence upon you, you know, like. The, the insisting that there would still be music and song and, and, and connection was really inspiring to me. And it made me think immediately, if we're not able to connect, how do we connect? Or how, you know, what does art mean right now in this moment? And for me, the, the really first thing that came up was this, uh, this sort of kind of understanding that it has to be participatory. It no longer really makes sense to sit alone in my studio and make marks. It feels as though if I'm not inviting space for other people to also make their marks, then, then I'm kind of whispering alone in the dark. So it led to doing a project called Apart Together where I sort of just set out a, um, an invitation, really did it in a very simple way, on Instagram saying, you know, come and make, uh, 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 make art with me. So that's the very quick. Yeah, thank mention. you. Yeah. And Donna, you, you are in a career where it's retail, you're, you're, how, how, you probably, the only time you get alone is when you sleep. So <laughs> this is, was, would, it's a big shift in how a person in public life has to operate. And maybe you could talk about that and, how how that's was both as as Liza talked about the first shock of that and then how uh, how that's rolled out over the last two months. Well, this crisis actually evolved. Uh, first, seeing what was happening in China and realizing we weren't getting accurate information, and um, talking to Tony Fauci, who I worked with for eight years, and he kept coming up uh, to Congress and briefing us and. Uh, it just unfolded in a way. Uh, I've been in crises before, obviously nothing like this. Um, but I just, what's hit me over the last few, few months really is um, the human spirit. I mean, the kinds of things that Liza talking about, the stories of the kids that are checking on the seniors in their neighborhoods, uh, the creativity of the American people in trying to connect with their elders who are stuck in nursing homes, who they went to visit every day or, or every week. Um, peering through the glass, the imagery of that. Uh, Matisse once said that creativity takes courage. Well, it's not just for artists, it's for the whole population. And um, the courage of people all over the world to connect. Uh, I, I'm a retail politician now. It's not quite, it's very different than, um, than what I was before because I'm answering questions and helping people at a street level, which is not usually what members of Congress do. But I've seen the humanity of people in my community in a way that I didn't quite see before. And I've had conversations, people call my office not not to get an answer, but to cry, to tell me about their distress, what's happening in their families. And that has to touch you and reshape you. Yeah. And we, we don't think of politics as working that way anymore, as a sense of connectedness, as a, a way that we can, um, can be together. And I don't know that there are, there there are still many politicians I would not want to cry to and would not feel safe or welcome or responded to and uh, in three languages by the way in my <laughs> <laughs> but so so uh, thank you for that but how how do we make do you, are you confident that that will ripple out that we that that kind of habit of engagement can appear can overwhelm some of the noise of negativism and uh, and hostility that's, that's 
certainly more the news that people experience. So there's that huge disconnect between people's lives of what that would be to, as you said, volunteering today um, for food delivery thing for, and all the people who actually do that and the people visiting them. But, but then you turn on the radio or the television and that is not the experience you have of it. And that's exactly right. But uh, you know, if um, I do, and I think it's gonna change us forever. I think we've made more connections with family and friends I've called people that I don't normally call on the phone. Um, I've called them, I've connected with them. I've connected with groups of old friends um, in a way I haven't before because I had an opportunity to see them or you know, we just emailed each other uh, back and forth. I've had deeper conversations. Um, I've read more books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It almost seems as if there's a kind of collapse of a kind of hierarchy. I mean, when you're talking about people feeling comfortable to call a politician and tell them what's going on, but just this kind of collapse where we sort of, we would feel sort of disembodied from basics, from how we get our food. Suddenly, I mean, when you see that delivery guy bring that box of food and you, you're like, bless your heart, you know, it's just like the love that you feel for people who are, you know, they're at the grocery store. I mean, that's a real thing where you're suddenly, you know, there isn't kind of this us and them or this sense of other. It feels like there's a kind of collapse where it's kind of unilateral because we're all facing this. And so if there's any, if there's any light in this, it has to be that. And Donna, I sure hope it really will change people. You know, I think there's a lot of people who are truly waiting for things to go back to normal. I really think that, that you know, that it's all, the, the curtain's going to lift and we're all going to just go back to normal and they can just go business as usual. But, um, I, I, that defies any kind of logic in a certain sense, don't you think? I mean, there's no way it really truly can, at least for some time. Now, yeah. people that have suffered trauma, it never goes back uh, to be exactly the same. Now, we do want to make it in some ways the same for kids. It may be organized differently, but we want them to have schedules, to have security, to feel self-confident, and we'll have to figure out ways to, to do that. But for all of us, uh, there always will be a little skittishness. But we've seen things that we just haven't seen before. I've never said thank you to so many people in my life. Mm -hmm. I said hello to a lot of people. And I know people that provide me with services, but I've never said thank you so much as mm -hmm. I have through this crisis. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was thinking about uh, that and your practice, even uh, working with beads, Liza, is... Uh, you know the, where the word bead comes from? It comes from the word for prayer, to pray. That's bead right. is that word. And so prayer beads came from that, but that sense of asking and praying. Yes. And it reminded me of something my sir Eckhart said, saying thank you is prayer enough. Mm. And being able to say thank you. That's and um, so, and thank you is this kind of shared, sense of community, whether, uh, so I, I thought about that, Liza, with that practice you have and, and what that process means. And could you talk a little bit about how that's worked with communities of people, most particularly with women in the collective in Durban, but uh, communities of people who've worked together on your, your projects, how that's, how that's worked? Well, it was lovely actually to find out that that beads meant prayer, you know. Um, it's lovely to find out that something that you do, and I think actually if you dig into anything that, uh, that, that one does, like if you if you under, get underneath the, the in, underneath the muscle of something, you find out, um, you find the beauty in it. And I, that idea of prayer really is, is kind of gratitude, right? It's that idea that, um, and, and also the other word that comes to mind is presence. So um, prayer beads, you know, where you have these monks who are, you know, using each bead or, or in Catholicism. And so this, this is a material that's used just to, to, to ground oneself and to have the sense of presence. But um, I kind of didn't know that when I started out um, using the material. Um, it kind of um, is something that's grown um, out of a, an interest that I, I had in kind of thinking about craft, actually, and thinking about how does... How is, you know, here I am, this artist working in craft, and yet there are parts of the world where women are making things out of beads. And could I, could I go somewhere where, um, you know, so 
In 2005, the HIV epidemic was, um, the epicenter of it was in KwaZulu-Natal. And at the same time, this is a culture, this is a beadwork culture. This is a culture that we're doing this incredible beadwork. So my question was, you know, could I somehow um, put together my own art and what I do and bring it to um, women who are in need of work and what could we make together? It was kind of a question, a creative question. And it kind of led really to working in community and finding out um, what that looks like, what it means. I had to kind of um, had to kind of re rethink everything, all of my assumptions about self, about who I am, who I'm responsible to. What are the ethics of being an artist? Who am I responsible to? Who am I responsible for? Um, who you know, sort of all of these questions, and also being in a place that where infectious disease was really um, a, a central subject of the studio. You know, um, TB is very prevalent um, in an HIV, um, in a place where HIV is so prevalent. So TB is a sister to it. So we were all the time grappling with um, infectious disease. And it really um, is something I've thought about for many, many years in my own studio. And of course, in this present moment, infectious disease, when one person's infected, the entire place is infected, whether or not you show symptoms, because you're living in a place of constant funerals. So um, it turns out that, that the idea or the practice of beads held all of that from, um, and has been the center of something for me and for a, a, kind, of, a kind of metaphor maybe that, um, that I've been really amazed to be part of, really humbled actually to be part of, something very much bigger than I ever could have imagined. Yeah. One thing... Um that you said once that I'd love you to talk about in that experience when you first got there and you're thinking through what you can, how you're going to work with these women. And as you've said, other cases, people who've been to as many 40, 50 funerals, uh, you know, with that, that kind of staggering experience with Donna and I both know about even the AIDS epidemic here in the United States and Donna with you globally too. And, uh, but you said in the one interview, well, I knew they got me when I arrived because they were singing. They were singing gospel songs. People, and you saw people who were going through so much, had this immediate joy, and a joy that even strangely connected to your own childhood of some similar kinds of music, which yes. I found very moving. I guess I think we're all seeing this firsthand now. Because this thing of, of when things are truly, truly bad, we don't have time. You just don't have time in the day. Right. You just really, really don't. You have to kind of like get on. And one of the things that I think happens when you have a lot of overload is any opportunity for joy or laughter. You just grab that because the rest of the time things are so heavy. So um, I think people are seeing that now. Why a lot of people are um, coping OK, dealing in ways it's, it's really kind of sometimes got to do with, you know, I don't have time to think about it. I don't have time to like get really deep on this. I actually have to just get on and move one foot in front of the other in front of the other. So I think in a, in a place where, you know, um, funeral homes are a growth industry, um, we're seeing that now in the U.S., we're seeing that around the world. Um, maybe it's an opening for a certain type of um, practice um, that has to do with the human spirit, that does bring out the beauty of the human spirit. I mean, the greatest art has been made during times of, of horror and trouble. So that's no accident. And Donna, how does that happen? You have two, just before we started, um, uh, you were talking a little bit about having, working with constituents in this environment, having a town meeting that could have 2,000 people in it. So could you talk a little bit about for that engagement with the people of, of South Florida right now? Well, it, it's not, when you do a town meeting, it's, it's not just giving people answers. It's showing your humanity and giving them hope at the same time. That's what leaders do. Um, that's why the arts are so important at this point, Tom because um, the creativity, whether it's an artist like Liza or music, um, I think is what's going to get us through this. And she's right. Some of the greatest art has, has come out of some of the greatest tragedy 
That's true of literature as well. It's true of poetry. Yeah. And, um, but my job is to not simply give people the facts and point them in the right direction for help, but also to give them a sense that there is a tomorrow and, and that uh, we're working very hard uh, to make sure that they and their children have a future. What leadership is all about is talking about the future. I hate people that go through their resumes <laughs> or, or talk about what they did in the past. First of all, my resume is too long so I'd rather talk about the future. I'd much rather talk <laughs> about the future and particularly the future. And that's what we're, uh, that's what many of us are trying to do in, in Washington at the same time. It's that reassurance, but we're, we're enabled and lifted by the artists in our community during a very, very difficult time. Yeah. And we're a community that's used to visitors. I mean, Miami Beach where the bass is located uh, Miami Beach has 90,000 residents and 10 million visitors. Right. We cannot maintain the economy of Miami Beach without those visitors. No. And we have and to- sure, My mother, my 80 year old mother and I walk at seven miles a day. She, uh, she's quite something and you, you know her, Donna. But so we walk early in the morning around 6 a.m. And this morning, we, Ocean Drive was, closed and you you can walk it at 6 a.m no one no one just emptied of 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 all that vitality uh and craziness of course too but that that is miami um uh, so i wanted to switch to something that i i'd be curious to hear your both uh opinions about this one of the issues that in in doing the public work you're doing that that matters uh Donna, is competence, is actually having practical solutions for people, giving them faith and hope because services get delivered, answers are accurate, and you know, there's some clarity in the uncertainty that people have a certain kind of expertise and knowledge at work and they they do it. And um, and you said, you know, we do this all the time. I, I heard you in, a, in another interview and you said, look. We go through natural disasters like hurricanes all the time. And you know what came in my mail today? This guy, you said, there's a whole routine of how we go through hurricanes. And I thought, it actually did arrive. There's hurricane seasons here. And it's page after page of all the, we don't have that for this moment. There's such a weird disconnect. It's, except we have something simpler, much simpler. Because we don't know very much about the virus, what do we say to people? Wash your hands, wear masks, Mask. practice social distancing, and isolate yourself as much as possible. So mm -hmm. we're using low tech strategies here until we know a lot more about this. In many ways, they're easier to communicate. The problem is, with all due respect, we have a president who steps all over that message. Yes. Even as our mayors and our governors and everybody in our community, including the artists, are trying to transmit it as straightforward as possible. There's no nuance here. It's right. just a, a straightforward uh, strategy. Now, if you downloaded what the mayor of Miami Beach or the county has done for us or in California, they've got a lot more detail about if you want to open these are the things you have to do. But what are those things? They are getting tested, um, their, uh, their sanitation, they're cleaning everything, they're washing your hands. I mean, we're again back to low tech. We're not talking yet about immunizations or treatments or all of the more sophisticated uh, medical kinds of things. It's straightforward public health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what, what the way I wanted to talk, pull that back to uh, art making, the practice of that lies, is that in a lot of this, it is the habits of our practice, the skills we have and that we practice together and the work we do and the routine sorts of things. And that's a lot of what all artists and writers that I know Liza do too. They have a practice that involves specific work habits and ways of being and that kind of 
get practical, like where the tough, where the going gets tough, the tough get going and in that way. And I'd, could you talk about that? Because I seem to be seeing that that creative practice, the craft of living get expressed in numerous ways that there's almost a, seems to be a new self-awareness that people are having as they go through their days. It feels very much like the practice of making things. Mm. I guess I wanna be really honest here and, 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 and I, I love what you're saying, but I, I'm afraid that maybe what, what you're saying is only speaking to a small percentage of people who are privileged um, and not in a very rough situation, right? So um, uh, there's a great deal of people that are in, uh, I mean, one of the reasons I started this project at Part Together is because I got really worried about kind of mental health, what this picture looks like, you know, when you're stuck in a place. And I, I, I don't really believe in this idea that, you know, you have to improve yourself. I'm not really into sort of art as a self-improvement, but I do think that having meaningful work sure is a, just a practical thing on a, you know, just, just do something that, that, that builds more meaning. So if things are being taken away, have more that's being, have more that's being built than taken away right now. No pressure, you know, no, like no, not another reason to hate yourself. <laughs> another reason, oh my God, you know, I mean, because one of the things that I was doing early part of this was I would, I would wake up quite early and really put myself to a certain task. And I realized at a certain point, you know, my breakthrough is kind of when I realized I'm going to stop trying to feel good right now. How about we just stop trying to feel good? Because there is not really a way to feel good, especially if you, even if your own life is okay, which, which really mine is, even though I've had um, a death in the family and um, I'm, I'm in a really beautiful, my family's really beautiful. I'm with my favorite two-legged people, or, you know, I'm surrounded by love, you know, my husband and my daughter. But um, if you read the news, you're going to be unhappy. I'm sorry. You know, so there's no way unless you're missing a giant chunk of empathy you know, to see those bread lines, I mean, it's just, it just breaks your heart. So where does art matter in that moment when you know, no one's gonna look at it? Do you know, like when, when museums are collapsed and you don't have an opportunity to exhibit it, you can't, I don't say, so where does, where does art have meaning? And um, Donna, you mentioned poetry. I mean, poetry is just to start to not only read poetry, but to think on poetic terms in, um, right now, to look at the picture right now that we're facing and see it in poetic terms, that's a really helpful response to, to what's going on, to suffering. So in the best of times, Tom, you know, like, yeah, I wake up and I'm totally self-distancing, you know, mm -hmm. all the time. That's what I do. That's why I was like, I mean, I love that. But this is a different moment, right? Where like afterward, you're not going to have a drink with friends. So when that starts to become interminable, when it starts to become a long slog and it starts to become... Donna, earlier you were talking about that weariness that people are having now. People are angry and just weary from this thing. So now what? So how do we pull it back and continue to shape and see the poetry, the poetics of it? I love this thing of, you know, um, to know a sense of sadness that smells like pineapple. I mean, automatically that makes you feel better. <laughs> Yes. So that you know, just sort of finding little glimmers in your day that that are just little pockets of beauty, little um, little glimmers. I think are something that that you build on, and that's why I think it's important for all of us to be participating in beauty. That it, art is not just for the people who are, you know, the artists, the, you know, the, the 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 ivory tower. It's really for every one of us. Yeah. Donna, you too. I want to see some art. <laughs> uh, Donna, what all, all, over, all, over my apartment. Apartment. all over my apartment. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Lots of art. If you're not looking at Biscayne Bay in her apartment, if you turned around, you'd see it's filled with art. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh, so, I've, uh, I've I wanted to ask you, Donna, to follow up on, on something that Liza just said there about meaningful work for people. You know, when one of the things that seems necessary is a lot of people are going to need work, period, and, and meaningful work to do. And when we look back at what happened uh, after the Great Depression, there were many efforts that engaged uh, communities in infrastructure and things, but actually the arts were central to a lot of those efforts that people went around uh, doing all kinds of things, artists and architects throughout the country is there any talk about projects of meaningful work that might be a response besides 
you know, trying to fix Florida's broken unemployment insurance program. So, but what emerges for this to adjust to the shock that a lot of people are going to be out of meaningful work? You know, my hope is that uh, once we get to a discussion about an infrastructure bill that we're also talking about, um, about art as part of that, the way they did um, in the 1930s. There's no question uh, about that. And, and you could, you and I have both lived in New York City. I mean, you could see it all over uh, New York, the impact of, of hiring artists during that time. And New York and other places continue that tradition in construction where they did a set aside for art as part of construction projects. I was president of Hunter early in my career and we bought artists that who, who had been, um, because we were building new buildings, who actually had taught at Hunter. There was a Tony Smith outside, big sculpture. Um, because Tony Smith had taught um, at Hunter, um, as well as a number of other artists uh, who had been on the faculty. And those set-asides reminded us that, um, that uh, these weren't just utilitarian buildings. First of all, we hired great architects, but we also um, displayed art and purchased art as part of it, new artists, uh, older, more established uh, artists and built galleries as um, as part of this. There almost is not a university in America that doesn't have a gallery right. of some kind right. that's not right. that hasn't made an uh, investment. I was at Wisconsin, which has a magnificent uh, public uh, art commitment, but also uh, in its own museums, um, as we do in Miami, all over Miami. We yeah. have. Uh, almost as many museums as they have in Tokyo, plus the private uh, uh, contributions. But we need to get people outside to do that. One of the things we forget is that most poor people live in small spaces, not in big spaces. And while we can talk about what we can do in our spaces, they're, they're living tightly. And um, the frustration, the mental health complexities, having uh, the kids at home, this is a, this is a much more complicated um, uh, period for people that don't have resources. Not only the scariness of not having enough food and not having a job, and we have to pay attention to that. Yeah, very much. Um, I've been asked to say, so we, we've got about 10, 15 minutes we were gonna talk, but then we're gonna open up for questions. So if you have questions, type those into the question comment field on Facebook and, and we'll get those to Donna and Liza in a bit. So please, please um, type those in and, and have uh, things to ask. So one of the things about those museums and institutions you've talked about, Donna, they're gonna go through a lot of trouble too. And thinking of, of uh, they're going to have a lot of institutions of all kinds are going to have to rethink their models and what they do and how they uh, function. How optimistic are you that art museums will and and the arts in general won't be well if we're looking down our urgent priorities and taxes revenues have disappeared and we're really struggling? How do we have a conversation that isn't all or nothing? The arts can can wait. Or do we we've got, maybe we've got to have just a serious do. conversation. We cannot live. We cannot be a civilized human human beings. We can't be a civilized society without simultaneously having uh, the arts in um, in our in our hearts and in our communities. And you know they're going to have to space people as they come in. You may have to make an appointment um, uh, for a slot. Uh, they'll have little pause outside where you have to space yourself as you're walking through. What I worry about is your ability to linger. Hmm. Right. And Liza yeah. can talk about that. When I think about how I go to museums, but they are the most creative spaces on earth. They will figure it out. Right. But, um, but lingering, thinking about people that want to linger. I grew up on the Cleveland Museum of Art. 
That's where I grew up. One of the great yeah. museums of the world, yeah, exactly. inside and outside. Yes. And we were taught to linger. First, I love that word linger. That's a poetic word lingering because it's almost onomatopoetic, right? It, feel, it sounds it, uh, as it means. But actually, I'd like to hear your take on that, Liza, about the idea of lingering. Your own work demands events about of and provides the opportunity for immense amount of lingering. And it's it's not a one take kind of experience. These are uh, atmospheric, environmental experiences that uh, nobody just has an image of and walks through a past. So I'd be interested in how, what, how, how do we think about the idea of what it means for people to look at and experience things in a time we're gonna maybe be separating and moving people along on a schedule. Yeah, I mean, museums are these repositories for contemplation. That's exactly what they are, right? They're, they're places where you can go. You, it, it's not about gathering so much as it's about lingering, as you're saying, and, and contemplation and um, calm. I mean, really just a sense of calm. A sense, I think, that beauty and art give a sense of calm, even if it's difficult subject matter, um, even if it's problem solving, even if you're looking at something that's really a challenge. You know, it's it's that um, it's that ability to be somewhere um, and see many, many, many ideas um, celebrated, um, given space. I mean, if there was one place where people really can social distance, it seems to me it isn't a museum. Because these are open, wide open spaces where you know you're not being invited. But you don't want people to talk. You don't want people to be you know face to face. You're all facing out towards something. So if there was a place and space where people can do that, certainly seems it could be a museum. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, in terms of uh, um, timing, how how um, people come in. But I think that artwork. Um, I mean, something I think about a lot that I really love about art is the silence. You know, that, that I'm obviously not all art, but, but I, I love the silence of a painting, the silence of a sculpture that, um, that invites contemplation. And later on, you can study it, you can read about it, you can learn about it, and it keeps becoming deeper and deeper and deeper. So it's not just a visual experience, it's an intellectual experience. It's, a, it's an experience of the soul. And, um, and at the end, it does change you. If you spend an hour in art museum or if you spend an hour um, watching a YouTube tutorial, you're gonna be a different person, those two experiences. So yeah. you need it. And I think you're right, Donna. I think one of the things about needing art, and I say it with a certain kind of, you know, since it happens to be the world that I'm in, I don't mean, oh, the world needs me. Actually, I think that the world doesn't need me at all. I think that right at this moment, what we need um, is each other. And we need to kind of think about sustainability for the arts. And sustainability would mean that it isn't about celebrating, let's say, two vaunted celebrated artists, but rather to see how can we share that? How can artists work collaboratively? How can we invite um, people to participate? That feels more sustainable right now. I mean, if this moment could bring something that could allow art to be part of the conversation, that conversation is not going to really be sustainable if it's just for five celebrated people. It does right. need, that piece needs, it feels to me that that needs to kind of shift. Maybe. Suppose, suppose the transition was a 24 hour museum. Mm -hmm. So that some people could go at three in the morning. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Suppose our transition. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that as, idea. as we get back yeah. to the new normal was a 24 hour museum. At least mm -hmm. in big cities, it would uh, it would make some sense because that's the way you would spread people out. Because people, people are not going to be traveling back and forth for a while. But if you live in a place where there's a museum, that may be um, the way we 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 introduce reintroduce yeah, like our museums. Well, it's kind and, of like therapy. You have to pay for your therapy. So maybe yeah. if people have to like struggle a bit to get there, right? Maybe they'd appreciate it more. Maybe they would spend more time with an object rather than doing the selfies. <laughs> yeah. But to get to your point, Liza, I love this idea and I'm going to push for it. I'm sure Sylvia is kind of rolling her eyes right now. I'm going crazy. <laughs> but, uh, but, so, but you're even asking, if I hear you, Liza, right, it's, it's partly about 
even redefining what an artwork is, that it, an artwork might be the, it, the experience of making it and the expansion of who's involved in making it. Is that somewhat what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, art is a, is a kind of, it, at the end of it, 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 it is a thing that you make, the thing that the completed thing, but also the metaphor of the making of it, sort of the, the, the lesson that the making taught us. So when you look at, say, an Agnes Martin picture, you're, you're not only seeing this painting that she produced, but you're also seeing the lesson of her life, the rigor that she brought to her practice, the, 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 the rigorousness and the, the adherence to a, a single line, the kind of um, integrity of her line. That, that is more than just the thing, it's the sum of the thing itself, right? So there's that, the, the ethics in, well, involved in a sense that when you're looking at art, you're looking at a kind of um, evidence of, of ethics, evidence of, um, of a certain kind, I don't really mean it in a moral sense, but in a, um, a sense of, um, of the integrity of something. So the integrity of an artwork teaches us something about what it is to be alive. And right. how do we, um, right now in this moment where people are, really very, we're also disembodied. We're here like tapping the screen, like <laughs> that's all we have, you know, it's like the screen. So how do we have an experience of art right now? And, and when the doors do open again, I really think that we're gonna be looking at sustainability, right? Like how do we sustain the arts? How do we make this a conversation that is relevant, that isn't just um, this bloated market-driven conversation that has been so over the top in the last, you know, I don't know, when would we, when would you say it got crazy? Because it's been crazy for a while. So yes. it seems like that's about participation, about having, trying to, um, and, and having a better relationship between what education and, and um, making art. You know, art, the art education department can collaborating more with the curatorial department, shouldn't be separate. So I could preach for days on that one. <laughs> Yeah. They should okay. be com combined because artists are teachers. Agnes Martin was a teacher. She was a spiritual teacher. I mean, she was one of the great spiritual teachers. Yeah. Just it making was. that line out there, you know. Alone, by the way, social distancing. A lot of social distancing in her life. She was a great writer, too. And she had such a great sense of joy and humor, even how she titles her poem of uh, her paintings were like poems and things. So yes, yes, and we could yeah, no, we could look at the history of art that way and writers and, and things to to have uh, that sense. But this makes me feel very optimistic from both of you. I feel uh, a real sense of both the practice of what you're both doing and then a kind of hopefulness that's making me hopeful. So let's open it up for some questions. I think uh, people are gonna I'm supposed to get these on my screen soon enough. Um, but uh, so Don, is that that's is that the city of Miami? That's downtown Miami behind you. Downtown Miami. Yes. It's part of my district. Right. I represent the beaches. The beach is way, All the way down to the beaches. Keep it clean. Yes. So, uh -huh. Coconut yeah. Grove, Liza. Come visit. Oh yeah. my wish. I'll be there. Tell so for over there. Yeah. So both of you, what's one place you want to linger as soon as you can that you can't right now? Where would, where's one of the first places you want to go where you, when that things open up more? To the bass. <laughs> to the bass museum. <laughs> it's coming, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> many wonderful museums in my district, the Perez, the Bass, Museum of Contemporary yeah. Art. I mean, um, uh, I live in a museum. I work in a museum in Washington. I live in a museum in, yeah. in Miami. I live with art. I bet you that's true. I bet you there are not many more districts uh, than yours that have as many museums. It's probably whoever represents Manhattan, right? Yeah. Per square mile. I'm seeing, oh, I'm getting 20 questions. Okay, here we go. They're coming in on my cell phone. That's why I said. Isn't that a show? Okay. 20 questions. I know, 20 questions, yeah. that's right. Okay. 
Uh, <laughs> Eliza. <laughs> here's a question for you. The, the budget for 2020 included a $1.2 billion decrease for the CDC and a $4.5 billion decrease for the NIH. And these cuts with other changes comprise a total decrease of $24 billion. Is HHS getting adequate funding to, uh, to combat this or future pandemics? Uh, let me answer that quickly. That was the president's budget. We ignored it. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, NIH got huge billion dollar increases, as did the CDC, particularly during the COVID-19 crisis. But every year, the president has uh, proposed cuts in the CDC and NIH and FDA and we've just ignored it and replenished the money with more. Those institutions will save our lives and are in the process of saving our lives. Another question also for you, for you both though, this is, um, a, we, we agree about the importance of the impact of the art, but the government continues to try to cut and do away, especially art in the schools. What do we do to change that mindset? Elections, elections, elections. Yeah. Um, you know, we just don't let that happen. We, the Democrats control the majority in the House and uh, we're committed to art in the schools. We're committed to our investments in museums, our investments in the humanities, um, in the National Endowment for the Arts as well. Um, yeah. We will survive um, and the arts will survive all of this. I think the ideas of the 1930s where we employed artists and let them do spect pretty spectacular things um, is our very important ideas to integrate. Yeah. Um, to stay, I actually feel passionately about arts education for kids because that's how you create people who are, who are creative and, and feel permission to be creative, but also passionate interest in the arts later. People have learned to make things and have physical sense of materials and, and connect their inner lives with the outer world of making things. Donna, you have a pro you had a program at the University of Miami that did this with music for kids. And little kids, really little, little kids. kids. Right. Yeah. How does that work? Well, uh, we um, it's basically a weekend a kind of camp for really little kids. But we also had another program that I think was very important. And that is we matched music students who had an, who played an instrument with a low income student in our community who played an instrument and they st stayed with each other for four years. Low income kids can't get private lessons but we gave right. them private lessons by matching a student with them. It changed our students' lives. It made them, um, it made them citizens of our community as well by matching students. Um, and, and anything we could do in the arts to reach out to our communities, I think are, um, are things that we need to do in all of our museums in our community, including the private museums. I think the Dela Cruz's do magnificent things with young people in our community to introduce them to the arts and to take them to New York. And and continue to introduce them to the arts is important. Look, when I was in elementary school, we went to the Cleveland Museum and the Cleveland Institute of Art, uh, and I came from a working class neighborhood, and we all were at least twice a year we made those trips, and it had an impact on us. And the more people that have a firsthand experience, that's really what you're speaking to. When people have that experience, then they know it in their bones. It's not just a, you know, why are you wasting money on this? It's actually, you know, oh, I get it. I get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we just got a, a question from Janine uh, Etherton that you had both talked about uh, how we have to be very aware that a lot of people are in very confined space with many people and don't have time and space for, for themselves and do that. And she says, I'm lucky enough to have a house with a yard. Do you both have any ideas of how we address that plight? We have yards for everyone called parks. And as we begin to open up spaces, 
we have sidewalks in communities. Some communities are safer than others, so it depends on when you go out. But I think getting people outdoors, have to wear masks in certain situations, have to do spatial uh, distancing, but all of these things are really uh, important. Um, I actually walked down to the Perez the other day and uh, walked around it feeling a little sad that I couldn't go in, but there were, <laughs> there were, there were steps and things that I could um, at least go on and sit on and, and think about what it would be like when I could go back in. Yeah. You were gonna say something about the thing in the, you know, just in the, in the breath, you know, that kind of thing where you find out where, where immensity can be in a small space. And sometimes immensity can just be finding it in the body, you know? I mean, there's a lot to be said for breathing, taking 10 deep breaths when you start to panic. That's a really simple little thing. 10 deep breaths, take it before doing anything else and having time um, to, to meditate or to do some kind of quiet space, you know, and you can really do that in a small space, but you can find out the immensity that can happen inside inside your own self if you can't get outside because i do have friends who are afraid to go outside you know it's it's yeah. um especially in new york city where you're in a very highly dense you know people are pushing and so just that ability to kind of find space within in a close space is important too yeah it's interesting to me i think one positive sign to me is that that language of self-care was that didn't exist in public discourse in in the past. And it does seem to me that it's creeping in to that. And I actually think, Donna, that, that has a lot to do with women in leadership, people who've had care for families and communities and things, and that the more of that uh, experience we get in leading things, the more attention we get to that kind of care for ourselves and our communities. It's, is that how does that hunch fit with you at all? There's more of that going on, but there's going to be more as we go on with this crisis, more discussion, um, more concerns, um, particularly about uh, about children, because the impact of being with their parents all day long is enough to make them want to go back to school for their parents want them to go to back to to school, but the psychological impact of this, we haven't begun to discuss. And I think right. um, a lot of the things like taking breaths and exercising and other things that we're talking about are going to be really important, but we don't have clear strategies or messages or we're all trying to figure out this on our own. Yeah. I got a, another question for people. are adopting <laughs> animals, by the way. They're more yes, it's remarkable, dogs. right? <laughs> and people are out walking these new dogs. I have met more new dogs in my neighborhood. <laughs> so uh, a question for Kathy Left. Do you think there could be traction in the next stimulus bill for uh, uh, arts and artists and culture? Some, uh, there was a New York Times mentioned a bill being advanced by mayors of metro, major cities for that. Have you gotten any requests from uh, mayor leadership in Miami about uh, stimulus for the arts in the next bill? I have not, though the arts are eligible as are artists for a lot of the programs that we put out, whether it's the small business uh, grants or unemployment, because we added people in the gig economy, we added uh, self-employed individuals, we added people that were furloughed, and we were specifically thinking of individuals, including artists, when we did that. Okay. Um, let's see, where are we? It's a strange thing to me. I'm, I'm used to a show of hands. <laughs> it's hard to get this. With it. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so Donna, I wanted maybe people people didn't hear when you were talking about if you could talk about your your day today because usually you come home, there are constituents to see, 
and things to do. And how is that modified now? What well, was, it, what was it, Sunday in Miami back from well, Washington? It's, it's modified uh, with, um, I mean, I was out this morning because uh, we were uh, out with Lee Schrager and we were selling things to try to help the uh, the local uh, restaurants and I was out there for a couple of hours and I came back in and I did a local television show and then I have three Zoom uh, uh, meetings today. Uh, I wouldn't describe this as a meeting. This is fun. <laughs> All right. So um, a friend and a new friend. Yes. <laughs> but it's, it's a very uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday I'm seeing constituents either on Skype or on Zoom or some other medium. So if someone's called my office and say, you know, I have a small business, I really need to talk through with you. They would normally get an appointment at my office, but now they're getting an appointment on a screen or a telephone call. So mm -hmm. I'll try to do a lot of uh, telephone calls, but I have no backlog now. So I'm just catching up. And then I have staff meetings, of course, all of my staff people, have laptops now and uh, from the government and they're all working and we're working on policy because mm -hmm. we're trying to make sure that uh, that we have the most sensitive policies for the package when we start negotiating with the Republicans. And I sit on the oversight, the big oversight committee that's yeah, going so to this keep COVID. an eye on all of that. Yeah. So it's busy. It's probably busier than I ever was before. Not busier than I was running a university, I should point out. <laughs> but, but it's busy enough. But I'm writing recommendations for students that are going to graduate school because I taught right down until I started running for office, big classes, that I'm writing a lot of recommendations for students. If you don't have a job next, you're going to graduate school. Yeah, you're going to graduate school. <laughs> and I'm working on a big proposal with my colleagues for national service. Yes. Which is really important uh, because we're going to need a lot of, it's not this just does feel like people working time. in community organizations. It's time to provide national service, which cuts your student debt. And, and brings us together yeah. and provides meaningful work. It, it, well, the, we brought all the Peace Corps volunteers, volunteers home, which was very sad. Uh, very sad. Liza, I lived in Iran, talk about art. Mm. I mean, the Persian culture was unbelievable in terms of art. Mm. Mm. The, the beautiful blue mosques, blue tiled mosques, if you have not been to Iran, mm. just getting online and, and seeing the art of, uh, of a country just devastated by terrible leadership. Yeah, that's it. But the art is still there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, when so, do you go to sleep, Donna? That's my, my pressing question. <laughs> How do What's you, that? When does Don ever sleep? I'm just listening. I'm going through all of your <laughs> oh you know, I sleep eight hours, seven or eight hours. Everybody says, you must never sleep. I am one of the world's great sleepers. In fact, um, I used to tell my staff, you know, the president of the United States hired us not for our stamina, but for our judgment. And my sense mm -hmm. is that you really have to get enough sleep to have good judgment and be able to be empathetic. Mm. Well, that's interesting because empathy is, that's actually an art term. I didn't know that before, but that it has a history from, from art, that idea of feeling into something. And I wonder if that doesn't change who you are. I mean, the fact that you love art. I mean, I wish all politicians loved art. Can you imagine the world we'd live in if everyone was like you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that is a great way to end this hour with you both. It's um, Extraordinary. I really want to thank you. I want to give a shout out to the Knight Foundation, which is an extraordinary Very good um, foundation that funds so much in arts and, and makes this series possible. So thanks very much to, to them and to the audience who tuned in and watched us from all over. And thanks for, for putting up this uh, strange virtual format, but a chance to talk with two remarkable people. And thank you so much, Liza. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye bye.